So Andrew Yang has unveiled his climate action plan, and let's go over it. Um, but before we do, I do want to kind of take a look at climate change in general and some of the tough realities that we're facing. So um, one thing that Andrew Yang says in his in his release, his climate action plan, is he starts off by saying it's worse than you think, lower emissions, higher ground. And he is right. It is actually worse than we think, because the reality of climate change is we're doomed. And it's not necessarily man's fault. We definitely have something to do with accelerating the process. But the fact is, is that uh, the climate changes. It has since the scientists can, uh, since we know the Earth has existed, um, billions of years, the Earth has gone through five different ice ages that they can document at this point. And it's cyclical. The climate is cyclical. And what happens is there's periods of warmth and there's periods of ice. And there's really not a whole lot that can be done about that. Um, we're up against Mother Nature, and Mother Nature has historically won every single time. So the reality of climate change is what's going on is the, the planet is warming. The planet would warm no matter what. Uh, it doesn't matter what, what we do when it comes to farming or uh, carbon emissions, you know, with burning fossil fuels, the planet would warm no matter what. And then the planet reaches a point because of the way the, the patterns of um, the water and wind circulation patterns, which has a lot to do with the, the continents shifting. You know, you got earthquakes and, and the, the, uh, the actual um, terrain is shifting around, you know, how it used to all be one giant kind of continent. And now it's broken up into various places. So that has shifted the way that the water has moved around the earth. That's shifted the way the wind has gone. Um, we've also got a, a changes in the earth's axis and the way it tilts and how it and Saturn and Jupiter and how it pulls on the earth. And, you know, there's a lot of factors that go into why the climate of the earth changes. But the earth does go through a period of warming and then it goes through a period of, of serious cooling where the, the earth starts to become covered in ice. However, what the scientists know is that there is no dispute that humans have accelerated the warming of the earth. So our carbon emissions through burning fossil fuels and through farming um, have created way more carbon dioxide in the atmosphere that is then, you know, what it's doing is warming the planet way faster than it would on its own, but it would on its own. So that is something to remember. Now, that doesn't mean that, okay, well, it's not our fault. We do nothing. No, we need to understand that we are drastically increasing. We're drastically accelerating the rate at which the earth is heating. So what we want to do, what we need to do in order to survive is we need to stop this rapid warming because we're bringing on calamity much much faster than it needs to. Um, and when you bring on calamity faster, you can't prepare, right? So it's kind of like, well, an earthquake. Um, earthquakes, you don't get any warning. They just happen and it's disastrous and people die, buildings crumble. It's really, really bad. Now, for example, a hurricane, you have a little bit more warning. You, you can see the hurricane coming. You've got days to prepare. You've got days to evacuate. So you can actually get yourself into safety. So that's kind of the difference when you, as we're because we're accelerating the Earth's the heating process way faster than we should. We're actually shortening our window to prepare for what is going to be fairly disastrous, which is the uh, the ice melts. And when the ice melts, the oceans rise. So that means those of us who live on the coast, you know, I live in Los Angeles, would need to move inland. It's kind of the joke of Kansas having some beachfront property, but maybe um, the oceans would rise the water would then flood in so you would have cities that go underwater which we're already seeing around the world um, and obviously areas get really hot and because of the the heat we're already seeing right around the equator now i know everyone's kind of freaking out about the amazon fires and that is something to freak out about but if you actually look at the entire if you look at the nasa imagery of all the fires going on around the world it's not just the amazon that's burning it's actually the entire equator that is burning if you just look here it's just south of the equator 
Uh, you've got Africa is very much on fire, more so than the Amazon. You've got you go into Asia there and you've got fires going on. And it's if you look, it's a straight line all across the world. And that area right there, right around the equator, the hottest part of the world is lighting up in flames because the earth is the earth is heating up. And as it continues to heat, as our temperature and climate continues to increase, we're going to see more and more of this devastation. And of course, as we see the devastation of these forests, which provide a lot of the oxygen that we breathe, we're going to have uh, air that's not nearly as clean. Obviously, there's going to be fewer areas to farm, so people are going to have famine. Uh, water is going to be an issue. You know, we're going to we're just seeing a lot of issues to where the population in the world is probably going to end up uh, forcefully decreasing because people will be dying off from heat and famine and fire. It's going to be devastating. So we are dealing with a serious situation. And Andrew Yang is not wrong when he says it is worse than you, you think. Lower emissions, higher ground. He's right. All When you look at that equator imagery that I showed you and everything's on fire, these people need to move to higher ground. If you're at the equator, you need to go north. Now, um, the reality of the situation also is that then there'll be an ice age and the north will be covered in ice. So all of Canada, most of North America will eventually be covered in ice. Now, this is going to be thousands of years, probably. So it's not anything you and I have to deal with in our lifetime, but it is something that we would want to maybe think about and maybe prepare for so that future civilizations would be able to um, uh, also survive an ice age, for example. So we've got to first, though, think of the imminent danger that we're in, and that is that the Earth is heating up. People that are close to the equator are going to be, it's going to be really tough for them. Um, and we might want to consider moving people in the world to higher ground. And if you're near an ocean, you might want to start thinking, if you think long term, like for myself, I think, well, maybe one day I'll buy a place in LA. And then I think probably not a good idea considering what's going on. It's probably best to move more inland, right? Maybe go back to Idaho where it's cooler because it's higher ground and it's away from the ocean. So it is worse than it, we think. Um, it, it So when people, you know, the climate change deniers, they're not 100% wrong when they say, okay, well, it's not it's not humans and this is all a hoax. It's not a hoax by any means. The earth is heating up. I'm sweating in here right now. It's, but it's not all man-made. The earth is going to increase no matter what, but we certainly don't need to be accelerating it. And we also need to be just taking care of our habitat. I mean, that should just be kind of basic common sense, right? You know, clean up your air, keep your ground, you know, keep your soil fertile and uh, don't ruin stuff. So let's go over Andrew Yang's ideas for lowering carbon emissions so that we can stop the acceleration of the heating of the earth that we're currently doing, because we're doing it at a very rapid rate. What would maybe take uh, 10,000 years or a thousand years or less, we're making it, we're shortening that time. And in the meantime, people will die of famine pretty quickly within, I mean, now people are dying now. So it is something that we definitely need to be addressing immediately. Um, his plan is to build a sustainable economy by transitioning away from fossil fuels to renewable energy. He wants to build a sustainable world. Fair enough, right? He wants to move our people to higher ground. He says natural disasters and other effects of climate change are already causing damage and death, and we need to adapt our country to this new reality. And he's right. We do need to be realizing this. Uh, be smart. Also, he says we need to reverse the damage that we've done. We need to be researching that and we need to hold future administrations accountable. He's saying that he wants to pass a constitutional amendment that creates a duty on the federal and state governments to be stewards for the environment. I think that's great. Now, he proposes we go nuclear. And this is not exactly popular with a lot of candidates. A lot of people don't really want to go nuclear. I even have some hesitations to it, but I agree with Yang um, it is the best solution we've got, and we probably should be seriously considering it. Now, he's saying that nuclear power is a crucial component in the move towards creating sustainable carbon-free energy for the United States. However, many people, including some other candidates, dismiss it out of hand. Why does it have such a bad reputation? He says two reasons. First, the public's perception of its safety has been skewed by TV shows like Chernobyl and The Simpsons. Second, nuclear waste is dangerous and long-lasting, and disposing of it is expensive. Both points are less of an issue with modern reactors. 
Nuclear causes orders of magnitude fewer deaths than fossil fuel-based energy, and that's not even considering the long-term impact of climate change from burning fossil fuels. He goes on to say, with modern reactors, safety is, a drastically, is drastically increased and nuclear waste is drastically decreased. After the completion of the Manhattan Project, America explored the option of using thorium as a potential source for civilian nuclear power. In the 60s, the United States experimented with a thorium reactor to generate power, but the project was shelved in the 70s. All the while, research into nuclear fusion devices continued in labs throughout the United States. Why did we go with uranium instead of thorium? Uranium is used in nuclear weapons. Thorium isn't. Yet another benefit to using thorium as a power source. He says thorium reactors have a few key advantages over traditional uranium reactors. One ton of thorium could potentially produce roughly 200 times more energy than one ton of uranium and 3.5 million times more energy than one ton of coal. That's a lot of energy. There is roughly three times more thorium on Earth than uranium, and we are already mining it as a byproduct of other rare earth element mining. Right now, we're literally just burying it back in the ground. Thorium mining is substantially safer than uranium mining. Thorium's primary ore, mon monazite, is retrievable from open pits, which receives greater ventilation than the underground shafts from which uranium is mined, decreasing miners' exposure to radon. Thorium reactors produce less waste than uranium reactors. Thorium waste remains radioactive for several hundred years instead of several thousand years. Thorium-based molten salt reactors are safer than earlier generation nuclear reactors, and the potential for a catastrophic event is negligible due to the design of the reactor and the fact that thorium is not by itself fissile. Nuclear isn't a perfect solution, but it's a solid solution for now and a technology we should invest in as a stopgap for any shortfalls we have in our renewable energy sources as we move to a future powered by renewable energy. So he wants to go nuclear. I think after reading his proposal and kind of looking more into it, I think he's right. I do think that I don't think we have a choice, guys. And I know it isn't a perfect solution. And I think Andrew Yang's right. It's not. But... It is a viable, quick solution to quickly stopping the amount of carbon emissions that we are emitting into the atmosphere. We're also going to have to look at uh, more sustainable farming practices. So it's not just the carbon emissions through burning fossil fuels, but it's also our farming. And we've got to get we've got to get realistic about this. And not only that, but then we need to start thinking about more solutions because when we stop with, you know, we start with step one, first of all, let's get everybody on the same page and understanding that, look, we are radically increasing the speed at which the earth is warming. And we as people need to stop that so that we can come up with a, uh, we have more time, we buy ourselves more time to then come up with more plans for how we're going to sustain and survive as the earth inevitably heats up. There's nothing we're going to do to stop it. And then it's inevitably going to cool way down. And we're not going to be able to stop that either. But what we can do is start thinking of solutions together. We can't, we've got to stop this partisan um, bickering back and forth and saying, oh, you know, it's not true. And, um, and you know, we kind of are going through this. this um, and, and then also saying things like, oh, you know, humans are causing the end of the world. That's really not true either. The, it's going to happen whether humans are here or not. These cycles of the earth heating and the earth cooling are going to happen. We could all become extinct tomorrow and it's still going to happen with or without us. But if we can at least come together and understand that and understand that it's going to happen no matter what, and it's also happening faster because of us, then we can start coming up with solutions for what are we going to do to stop this ex rapid acceleration that we're creating? And then after we do that, what are we going to do when, with this inevitability? How are we as a, as a human species going to come together to say, look, guys, we need to figure out a way to survive. And that, need, that means uh, we can't keep people trapped in their countries in certain areas and telling them that they cannot leave when they're part of the world, uh, they happen to be born in a very unlucky spot that is literally burning up in flames. 
I think we need to kind of regear our thinking on how we deal with borders and immigration, migration, hum, you know, human migration patterns and whatnot. We might need to start having some serious discussions on rethinking all of that and what we can do to keep humankind um, to survive this time around. So that is what's going on now. Um, and I think Andrew Yang has a really good plan. I'm on board for this. What what I am really interested in seeing is that CNN is actually hosting a seven hour climate change town hall. They're calling it. Um, it's a marathon where they're going to have ten candidates, including Yang, um, get up for forty minutes each and talk about their climate plans. And so each candidate will have their opportunity. Each of the ten candidates will have their opportunity to get on stage and really, really lay out their plan for climate change. I think it's great that they're doing that. I, I'm going to be interested to watch it myself or listen to it on, you know, through satellite radio or something. But I am really disappointed that two candidates in particular are missing from this conversation. And that is Jay Inslee, Governor Jay, Jay Inslee, who has a very comprehensive and solid climate plan and I think he should be heard, even though he's he hasn't made their qualifiers. Now, the way that CNN has decided who's going to be a part of this town hall, they're using the same criteria that the DNC is using to decide who's making the September debates. That is 130,000 unique individual donors plus four, uh, two percent in four of the polls. So Jay Inslee didn't get either of those. And so he's being left out of this debate. I think that is a big shame. I also think it's a really big shame that Tulsi Gabbard is not going to be in this because she also has a very comprehensive um, sort of Green New Deal, if you will. It's not called that, but it's an extremely comprehensive, well laid out plan. And I think it's a really a shame that she's not also going to be included in this because we need to be hearing from candidates who do have solid plans. There's a lot of candidates that just say, yeah, we got to do something about it. But what? And I and I actually I'm interested in hearing from some of them. Um, I think that there's going to be a lot of candidates like Pete Buttigieg, for example, and Klobuchar, who I think are just going to get up there and say, it's a problem. There's no doubt it's a problem. And we do need to do something. We need to look into it. I know Kamala Harris will say that a lot. We'll look into it. We'll look into it. We'll look into it. Um, versus other candidates like Yang and I'm sure Warren and Sanders and Gabbard and Inslee, who do have really solid, actual plans that are well thought out. Uh, those are the candidates we need to hear from. That's what America needs to hear. And it's a shame that in some of the instances, America will not. But we at least will be hearing from Andrew Yang a bit. I do think that he's a bit shocking for people because when he says, look, it's real, it's it's worse than you think. Lower emissions, higher ground. You know, when he says, get people to higher ground, this is bad. People kind of think, oh, my gosh, you know, what kind of a heretic are you? And actually, he's right. He's totally right. And... That is the unfortunate reality about it. So thank you so much for watching. Um, if you would like to support this show, I have links below for Patreon and PayPal. I do appreciate your support. And I will be back again with another video. Thanks for watching.